of these challenges. Yes, sir. I guess, let me just see uh, for video. So I think uh, Vibor, if you can first get my video enabled and then figure out the chat, uh, that that would work because then we can get started. All right. Um, um, uh, Varun, I'm sorry, I don't see any challenge from my side. I'm really do not know. If for uh, anybody else, uh, you know, maybe uh, Eljan Nikesh or Umkar can confirm it. Eljan yeah. Umkar, can you check? Uh, not that, uh, I mean, guys, you guys aren't missing anything special by not seeing me, but I think in the interest of time, we'll get started on uh, the presentation. Um, so do let me know once uh, my screen is visible. Uh, probably uh, you could confirm. Um, is everyone able to see my screen now? Yes, sir. Great. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, three-day training workshop on Digit. Uh, what I'm going to be covering uh, essentially is to give you an overview on who is EGA, what do we do, a little introduction into Digit, um, kind of touching upon why did we build Digit, um, and talk a little bit about our uh, the ecosystem that we have developed over the last four or five years, uh, how we are trying to institutionalize uh, the work that we are doing, and time permitting, walk you through a couple of quick case studies of the impact that we are seeing in states uh, that have implemented Digit. Um, and uh, like to keep this, uh, uh, you know, open session. So, Vibor, I'd, I'd request you to monitor the chat and the Q&A boards. Uh, so, if there are any questions, just stop me in the middle, and I'd be happy to answer them. So without further ado, let me uh, quickly introduce myself. So my name is Varun Basu. I lead uh, growth and partnerships at EGA Foundations. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to kind of give a very brief introduction into EGA Foundation, right? So we are a philanthropic mission, which was started way back in 2003 uh, by Nandan Nilakeni and Shrikan Nedamuni. Uh, and in 2003, they were, they were looking at uh, using uh, or kind of getting EGA Foundation to uh, solve problems uh, that urban cities in India were facing, right? By helping digitize service delivery so that citizens were able to have, uh, you know, more convenient access to services that are being delivered by the local bodies, right? Uh, we've obviously come a very, very long way from 2003. Uh, and today what we are looking at is um, you know, our focus is to help achieve SDGs. Uh, and I'll talk about what SDGs are for, for the audience that probably not familiar with the term. Uh, and essentially improve ease of living for citizens uh, by leveraging uh, digital public goods, right? So Digit, which is our open source DPG, um, free open source DPG, uh, how can we leverage that to create societal transformation in 30 countries by 2030, right? So today we've kind of started this journey and we've kind of matured in India, but really what we are looking, uh, or our North Star is saying, can we have the same transformational impact that we've been able to create in India uh, over the last 19 years? Can we do a similar transformation in 30 countries by 2030? And that's really the, the hockey stick of transformation that uh, EGAV is hoping to achieve, right? Um, Coming to the first point that I talked about, sustainable development goals, right? So the, the, the United Nations has identified a set of goals which most countries globally have signed up onto for improvement of quality of life for, you know, things like eradication of hunger, poverty, gender equality, access to clean water, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what we are able to do is using Digit help accelerate achievement of these goals. And today, uh, the programs that we run on Digit are helping impact these seven SDGs that you see here in the colored boxes at the, at the bottom. Now, how are we doing this? We basically have a three-pronged approach, right? So the first is really creating what we, what we like to call 
a population scale digital infrastructure, right? So uh, Digit is really an open source free um, modular uh, platform on which we can not only do service delivery, but it is open source for literally anyone in the technology community to pick up and build absolutely new use cases uh, using those components, right? And, and this, this three-day course will not only show you how do you set up Digit? How do you install Digit? Uh, what are your prerequisites? What are the kind of technology and programming skills that you require? How do you set up and customize existing reference applications on Digit, but also help you design new use cases on top of Digit? So for example, if you might have a completely uh, new use case, which we've not built on Digit, uh, we will, through our workshop, help you break down how do you do the uh, you know, design, how do you break it down into the modules or components that uh, are understandable in the digit platform and then recompose it back into your application. So that's that's one of the uh, foundation pillars that we use. The second one, which is equally critical, is government advisory policy and domain practices, right? So one of the things that we do is we work very, very closely with the central and state governments to help define uh, policies for digitization, right? And I will I will touch upon that in the piece of how we've been able to institutionalize Digit uh, and, and the programs that are being driven on Digit uh, in the last five, six years. And the third part really is uh, how do you create an accelerator, right? Which is how do you build an open digital ecosystem which is, which is supported by knowledge goods, which is supported by a center of excellence. And this training session that all of you are attending today is actually very, very integral to this open digital ecosystem, right? And, and our objective and mission is to make sure that all of you on this session are able to uh, learn, build, and enhance on Digit uh, with eventually, I mean, our, uh, our, our goal is how can we help uh, create a sustainable community around Digit, which kind of supports each other uh, by pushing all this content onto public forums. So we've got community sites, we've got GitHub forums. Uh, we want to kind of build a, a vibrant community there, which actually talks about how do you, you know, how do you troubleshoot, how do you build new case studies uh, on Digit, and and therefore uh, the purpose of this session. Moving on. Uh, just a glimpse of what we've done right in the last 19 odd years. Uh, what we've done so far is that there are 1000 cities that are currently running uh, some application or a set of applications which have been built on digit. And there are about 1500 more which have either signed MOUs uh, for implementation or are currently in the process of implementing solutions on top of digit. Today, we've got over 16 states uh, in India where uh, Digit has been deployed uh, or is in the process of rollouts, right? And that's really the coverage of two and a half thousand cities that we were talking about. Uh, we've, we've been able to uh, deliver services to about 250 million Indian citizens. Um, and that's, that's really coming from Digit. Apart from that, we also have um, another platform which we will not cover today, but it's called Divoc which is actually being used for the uh, COVID vaccination certificates, right? All of us have gone on to COVID to book our uh, appointments for vaccination. The COVID application is also running on a platform that is managed and developed by EGA Foundation. We've got about 100 plus partners uh, across uh, three, uh, you know, three sectors, as I'd like to call it, between Samaj, which is the civil society uh, entities, Sarkar, which are government uh, uh, you know, or, or quasi-government entities which are able to influence policy and decision-making, and Bazaar, which is the system integrators and partners who help develop uh, implementation solutions for uh, for state governments and central governments, right? Uh, the, the impact of Digit is truly being felt now that we've, we've actually got partners who've built almost, this number is slightly more dated now, probably about 40 solutions on top of Digit, apart from what we have already built as reference applications. And in terms of return on equity, right, I think uh, what we are able to do is get a significant scale multiplier where we have invested about $20 million into the development of this open source platform, 
But what we've been able to create is almost a half a billion dollar ecosystem uh, and state demand, right? And even today, as we speak, just for the urban missions, there is roughly about half a billion dollars of demand uh, in states across India. And this is just for digitization of urban local bodies, right? And there are multiple other use cases where digit can be uh, implemented. So in terms of opportunities for system integrators and partners, um, this is really the tip of the iceberg today where we stand. Uh, and a lot of opportunities can be, uh, you know, realized using digit. And we've reached a state uh, stage where states have been implementing or have seen other states implement and seen the success of digit and therefore are far, far more open to uh, looking at digit based solutions. <coughs> Sorry. In terms of, uh, you know, people who are our patrons or funding us, we are primarily funded by uh, not for profits, as you can see at the bottom. So Tata Trust, the Omidya Network, Nandan Nilakini Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are our principal sponsors who are helping us, uh, you know, drive the transformational work that we are doing. With this, I'd like to quickly get into... Is, if, you may try if your video works now. Uh, it looks like there was some option that was... Uh, sure. Right. Yeah. I think I think. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Now that you guys can see me, as I said, nothing special. Let's get into digit. Um, so, so let's talk about why we kind of came uh, about looking at digit. So, from 2003 till almost about 2016-17, EGA Foundation was building out uh, digitization of urban local bodies as a monolithic ERP software solution, right? And Sometime in 2017-18, as we were doing slightly larger implementation, so we had implemented in the state of Andhra Pradesh, and we were we were kind of talking about doing an implementation in Maharashtra, uh, we realized that the current architecture um, is reaching its threshold, right? Um, and this also kind of was something that we were seeing across departments in, in the state government, right? Um, each application used to work in its own silo, which used to consist of a UI, a business logic, and a database. Every department had multiple such applications, and then you had multiple departments, right? So what you essentially had in a state was say anywhere between 25 and 35 departments, and each department having anywhere between say 30 and 50 applications. So if you do that N by N, N, by N you're talking about 1500 odd applications, anywhere between 1000 to 2000 applications for a state government, right? Which were all running in silos, being managed by individual independent uh, contractors or SI partners, which made a lot of complications from a day-to-day -day implementation. So first being, citizens had to have access to multiple applications to even get uh, access to a particular service, right? Uh, state employees needed to have multiple logins. So within one department, if a state employee was responsible for two functions, he might have to log into three or four systems to get his work or her work done, right? Uh, there was no centralized view for administrators to see uh, what was happening with these systems, right? How many tickets were getting generated? How many requests were coming in? Uh, where were their delays and so on and so forth, right? And because these systems were running in silos, right? Uh, there was very little data flow between these systems, which was essential, right? Because uh, for, and we'll talk about simple uh, citizen-centric services where the same information is required at multiple touch points, right? And, and what that, allowed, that led to in the traditional context was the replication of that same data across different systems leading to data inconsistency, uh, erroneous data being entered. Um, and, and because these systems used to be running in small silos, they, they typically were not built for scale and performance. So as cities grew, uh, demand grew, or the same system needed to be replicated from one city to all cities in a state, those systems would start to fail, right? And, and needless to say, you had a lot of duplication of what, what we call common uh, elements. Uh, a simple example of it being uh, most systems need to have integration into a payment gateway for collecting the fees or, or payments or something as simple as an integration into an email or SMS system to be able to send out a notification saying that, you know, we have received your request, this is your request number. Every department was maintaining and building integrations into their own systems 
which left, uh, you know, which was a lot of duplication of effort and maintenance costs. So what we what we did back in 2017-18 is said, let us look at enterprise systems from a platform view. How can we look at building reusable components which can actually be leveraged across different departments, across applications in different departments? And that's really what led to the genesis of what, uh, what we call Digit, which is essentially a set of reusable building blocks, right? Uh, and what we have in Digit, right, is basically what we call the foundation or core platform, which is a set of shared registries, things like user, employee, um, property, uh, anything that can be abstract, you know, abstracted down to the most uh, fundamental level is available as part of the core platform. So you've got data, you've got core services, which can be reused and reference data, which can be accessed across different departments. And building on this core platform, you actually have domain specific platform services and data, right? And the beauty of this architecture is that, for example, if the health platform requires some data, which is in the core, it can make an API call to these reusable services and pull this data. Not only can it do it from the core platform, but let's assume the health platform requires information about your property, right? Because you might want to send somebody in to do, say, a, a polio vaccination or somebody is going door to door doing COVID vaccination and they require the address and, and details. They can actually make an API call to the urban platform where, say, something like a property detail is available and the number of people staying in that, uh, in that location. And that is also accessible uh, through open APIs. So all of these uh, independent boxes can actually make uh, open standard data API calls to fetch required data as and when needed. And, and so while we have certain implementations, we actually now have partners who are building other extensions. And I'll, I'll talk about that using the same set of components and the same uh, approach. Now, on top of this, what we have been able to create is a single unified experience for citizens, for employees, and for administrators. So a citizen now just logs into one application and whatever state services are being delivered through Digit are all accessible through that single portal. They can apply for it. They can track status of it. They can make payments for it. Everything is available to a citizen through an integrated uh, single app, which is uh, available through a desktop. It's available on the mobile app. In certain states, we've actually extended that and made certain elements of that available even through WhatsApp integration and so on and so forth, right? Or IVR. So it really depends on what your state wants to deliver as services. Um, and all of this can be delivered through a single unified uh, experience. Now, apart from a unified experience, reusable services, one critical um, advantage of this approach is that data elements now reside only in a single location and they can be accessed from different places. Uh, needless to say, with the right amount of access controls and security, which is natively built in, right? Uh, and therefore you only have one version of the truth, right? Which makes sure that there is no inconsistent data across different systems. Uh, and the way this platform is built is it is massively scalable, both horizontally and vertically, which allows uh, you know, states to be able to uh, add workloads very, very quickly. And we'll talk about how quickly are states able to implement and deploy digit-based solutions in the slides to come. I'm just going to pause here. Uh, Vibor, any questions at this point of time? Uh, All right, great. Uh, moving on. So if I was to do a quick comparison, right, between how Digit works and something that most of us are very, very familiar with, which is the Android operating system, right? Um, at the bottom or at the very base, we have something called the core data infrastructure layer, right? Which in the context of Android could be things like a number registry, a image registry, or a device registry. Uh, the same correlation into the Digit ecosystem are things like property, user, and employee. And I talked about that, right? Now, Overlying this information are a set of core services which use these registries. So in the context of Android, 
you have a camera service, which would be using something like an image registry, uh, a location service, which would be using information from a GPS registry or a notification service, which would be using a combination of these, right? Um, similarly, in digit, we have things like a billing service, a location service, a collection service. And these are standard services which are agnostic to what application is using them, right? So for example, in Android, a camera service could be used by WhatsApp for you to take a picture and send it to a friend or a colleague. The same camera service can be used by uh, Paytm as an app for them to take a picture of some KYC document, right? Uh, but the underlying service is the same being used across two different applications, right? Exactly the same logic works in digit at a solution level. The property tax would uh, module would use billing as a service for collecting the property tax. And the trade license module would also use billing to take the fees that needs to be collected for issuing a trade license, right? So that's really a simple analogy between how Android is built up as a platform and how we've built digit. Uh, as a platform. Uh, moving on, there are some key elements that we've used or principles that we've used uh, for building digit as a platform, right? So, and, and these are key tenets which, uh, which, are, which are imperative to the success of digit, right? So the first one being that it must be interoperable. We have to improve ease of integration between different systems because traditionally, uh, as I said, 1,500 applications probably running on 1,000 plus different systems, right, uh, have siloed data, which ensures or which kind of limits different departments to be able to access data for legitimate purposes, right? You need to have that information. And the only way today it works is by doing some sort of an Excel dump, then it is picked up, then it has to be imported. There are a lot of options of uh, you know, potential of getting errors into this data transformation that happens. The second thing that we've kind of, which is a principle of building a uh, digit, right, is unbundling, right, which is how do we logically break down a requirement to the smallest, simplest piece, right, and unbundle and minimal actually go hand in hand, is how do you break a problem into a small piece which is far more manageable and can be scaled independently, right? So this essentially allows us to, to scale out components independent of the use case. Uh, let me go back to the example of property tax and trade license, right? Now, underlying that is a billing service, right? Now, because we've been able to bring out billing service from outside these two solutions, the billing service can scale horizontally, which means that let's say I have 5,000 people paying property tax every day. I have 1,000 people applying for a trade license in a month, right? Now that load is coming into the billing service for making payments, right? But let's say tomorrow we decide to use digit for paying parking fees, right? Which also needs to have a billing service. If these billing services were bundled into the solutions, we would not be able to scale the billing service out. But now since parking fees collection also needs to use billing service, if we were using, or if this service was deployed on one server, we can very quickly you know, uh, scale this out to four or five servers because the load coming through the uh, parking fees collection could be as high as 100,000 transactions a day, right? And, and that's really the, uh, intent of unbundling and using minimal functionality, uh, which kind of leads me to the next thing, which is scalable. I think I've kind of explained that with the billing service saying that you should be able to scale this very cost efficiently, that the cost of scaling this out should be dynamic, saying that if I, if I only need to do, say, parking service during a festive season, which is for a two-week window, I should be able to horizontally scale it out for those two weeks and then bring it back to the set of servers that was being used for property tax and trade license. So the system needs to be very flexible and agile to be able to uh, cater to these kind of you know, elastic demands that could come up uh, on the system. From a information security perspective and data privacy perspective, uh, we obviously have to build best in class security and, and reliability, right? Because you're running mission critical workloads on it. Uh, we need to ensure that the platform is highly reliable 
and all data that is being stored is is absolutely secure and i think as we go deeper into uh, the architecture of digit we will you know the, the team will also explain how we kind of separate out pii data from transaction data how do how the analytics dashboards only have uh, you know anonymized data so you you don't know which individual users information is available on the dashboards uh, therefore maintaining security and privacy of individuals uh, we also practice open standards, right? So that uh, one of the critical things that we want to focus on as an initiative is how do we avoid the problem of vendor lock-in for governments, right? And the inability of for them to be able to pull data out because it is sitting in a proprietary database, right? So one of the things that we like to, uh, you know, communicate and, and tell our partners is that when we build on digit, the data registries should be open and standardized and you can build your implementation on top of it. But that ensures that tomorrow, if a state government wants to change direction or change uh, how they want to approach it, the data is still openly available and they can actually go from digit to starting to use an enterprise system because they have standard API through which they can call the data, right? Which is which is a problem if, if you are using traditional applications which are not open source. Uh, the last piece that we're trying to do or, or what we are working towards is how do we make digit far easier to use for, for uh, when we say customers, we are talking about state governments and urban local bodies. How do we make it easier for partners to be able to deploy, build and enhance on digit and, and how do we kind of create more and more learning content and put it out on our public sites for you people to be able to understand what are the typical problems, how do you solve it, et cetera. Uh, and the last piece is really about inclusivity, right? Uh, I think one of the typical concerns which comes up when we talk about digitization is that it can only cater to a certain sector or segment of society. But the way we build digit allows that uh, you, you can actually deliver this across digital channels, but also have this system running in kiosks where uh, people can actually walk in and get services rendered. Or in certain cases where, where state governments are running initiatives where they're going door to door to deliver uh, you know, services and benefits that uh, citizens are eligible for, they have a handheld device where they can actually tell you which services you're uh, eligible for, what are the benefits you're uh, uh, eligible for, and how they can deliver it again through this, uh, through this integrated platform. Um, any questions at this point of time? Yes, Saurabh. Uh, the APIs can be accessed by any non-digit platform as well. These are standard APIs. You can make, make calls to them from anywhere else. Uh, Elzan, would you like to add anything else here for, for the question that Saurabh has? Okay. Yeah, so you have answered. That's it. All right, Elzan, thank you. Uh, so moving on to what we have built, right? So today on Digit, we have uh, not only Digit Urban, which is actually our flagship, right? And I, I would imagine that most of the participants in today's training session are actually coming in to understand what are the reference applications that have been built in the urban context? How do you, how do you, you know, set them up? How do you make changes to those existing systems? But I think what we wanted to kind of also showcase is that we are actually implementing solutions beyond digit, which are, which are running on the same infrastructure, right? So we've actually got a solution around campaigns management for health case, health use cases which is being built on, on Digit today, right? There is Divoc. Uh, the Divoc architecture is slightly different, but the campaigns management piece that is being built for, for the health use case is being built on Digit. There is a public finance management platform called iFix that has been built, uh, which allows for complete fiscal transparency, right? So one of the big challenges in state and central governments is lack of transparency of how public finance or public money is actually flowing through what was budgeted, what was allocated, what was utilized, uh, and then the audit for that, right? And, and the iFix platform actually uh, helps create almost a set of standard fiscal events, uh, which allows 
uh, different departments to be able to share data and for the finance department to get a complete visibility into what money was spent, where, uh, how was it spent, and, and what needs to be done for the next uh, financial year from a planning perspective, right? So that's a very, very uh, strong use case. Uh, currently, we are, we are in the process of implementing this in the state of Punjab. Uh, there are also conversations uh, regarding this uh, that have just started for Odisha as well. But uh, there is a huge potential, right, for, for partners to be able to pick up the public finance management piece and take it to uh, states. Uh, and the last one really is around sanitation. We've actually built a, a fecal sludge management platform uh, called Disha, again, running on top of Digit, which is allowing uh, you know, citizens to raise tickets to have their septic tanks clean, cleaned for the vehicle to, to, for us to be able to track the vehicle in real time to see where it is, where it is, when will it reach our homes, and for complete uh, safe disposal of the fecal matter that is collected at a sewage treatment plant, right? So the only way that the, the truck operator can actually close the ticket or, or the ride that they're on is when they are within a GPS ring fenced uh, area of, a, of an authorized sewage treatment plant. So that also kind of uh, helps ensure that they are not discharging waste into you know un unauthorized places or a canal or a river or, or whatever, right? So these are four missions that EGAV is driving, but as I said, the ecosystem is actually building many, many more use cases beyond uh, these four. Uh, just a quick, uh, you know, glimpse into some of the reference applications. So we've got uh, these reference applications, which are part of uh, Digit Urban, and these typically capture anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of citizen transactions and account for almost 80 plus percent of the revenue streams for an urban local body, right? And this is available literally out of the box, which can be configured and deployed in a matter of months uh, for, a, for, a, for a state to start seeing dramatic improvement in both uh, transactions as well as in revenue streams. Um, I'm gonna spend a uh, quick time check. How are we on time? We're running a little behind. Uh, little okay, behind. I, I, I'll okay. speed up, yep. Uh, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the open ecosystem that we've created, right? And I, I was talking about three uh, types of partners or three categories of partners that EGAF has identified, right? So there are there is Samaj partners, right, who uh, basically work in uh, last mile citizen state uh, government interactions. There are Sarkar partners, right? So for example, Mahua, right, or PMIDC or the World Bank or, or DPGA who actually are working on uh, either government initiatives or are working on influencing or driving policy and decision-making uh, for governments, right? Uh, and there is obviously Bazaar, which is the system integrators and partners, which actually provide the scale muscle to be able to run multiple implementations across uh, you know, a country uh, and therefore be able to accelerate the digitization process. So we today have 100 plus partners on board and uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, partners who are, and people who are on the uh, sessions today are actually, you know, part of this bazaar ecosystem and coming on board either because they, they see opportunities where they can leverage digit or they've actually signed up MOUs with state governments to implement uh, solutions on top of digit. Now, what do we do for these partners? And, and this focus is really around the bazaar ecosystem is essentially at three levels, right? So we we uh, we have business sponsorship at the executive level where we review and do joint engagements to understand what are strategic priorities for our partners. How can we help them enable delivery of those priorities on digit, right? By doing workshops, we do quarterly reviews and we have council meetings where, where they share what, what, is, what are they hearing in the market? What are the trends that they are seeing? And then we kind of share how some of those can be realized or implemented through digit. Um, there is obviously a very, very robust enablement and technology advisory support that we give from program setups, governance, best practices, hands-on training, uh, you know, enablement sessions like the ones we are currently doing. Uh, and this is the technology and program advisory actually is, is before uh, partners get into an implementation phase. And when they get into implementation, we kind of support them 
in terms of enablement, in, term, in terms of giving best practices. We have a lot of documentation in terms of what should be the program governance structure that needs to be established, what should be your PM thing like, what skill sets should those people have when they're part of the PMU, what uh, enablement resources do you require from an implementation perspective, how do you do platform upgrades, what are the roadmaps, uh, you know, our, our vision is that hopefully by the end of this year, we will actually publish the digit roadmap uh, for everyone to see what's, what's in the pipeline so that as uh, you partners build on top of digit, you can actually see what's coming down the line. Um, these are some, uh, the next level detail of what we do from a program governance perspective. So as I said, we have steering committees, we have PMU reviews, we have te technology advisory committees, and, and all of these need not happen for a given engagement. I think it's, it's, it's depending on a situation and the uh, maturity of the partner. Uh, what we have seen is that some of our early partners who've done implementations now have in-house capability of doing things like architecture, review uh, and they only come back to egov if they have a completely new use case or they want to understand uh, if they make certain changes uh, what would be the impact and how would the core uh, code base be impacted by these changes uh, this is where we sit today right so we from an egov perspective we have 2000 plus knowledge assets all of which is available on docs.digit.org uh, you, you, you can actually uh, go through it at your convenience. Uh, literally anything that we do is created into a knowledge asset and published publicly so that the ecosystem can pick it up and, and build on it. Uh, we've conducted 17,000 plus hours of training on Digit, uh, enabling partners. Um, we've actually done hands-on training in our offices for 15 plus partners. Um, and, and this is really the output that we are seeing. So today, as I said, right, uh, there is, there, the, the market for digit, right, is actually over 3,000 crores, right? We've actually had partners who have contributed back to the open source repositories because, uh, you know, and, and this is something that uh, I, I advise all our partners to consider when they are building on top of digit. If they find certain use cases uh, where they find that it is generic enough, uh, we would welcome your contributions back into digit, but this is purely optional. There is absolutely no, um, you know, there is no hard and fast rule that you need to contribute back to digit if you are enhancing on top of digit. Anything that you build on digit is completely, uh, you know, your IP uh, till you choose to contribute it back into the uh, public repositories. Uh, so what we've been working very hard is we've also been driving policy changes to institutionalize some of these changes. And what we've done over the last three years is, is, you know, worked with the government to create a digital blueprint that changed into a national strategy, which was uh, launched in March 2019 as NUIS, right? And that led to the establishment of the National Herbal Digital Mission, NUDM, right? And uh, there was funds allocated by the central government where they have taken on uh, an, uh, a target that they would like to digitize all 4,500 urban local bodies in India by 2025, right? And the uh, Center for Digital Governance is working very, very aggressively to sign up states or sign up MOUs with states for implementation of digitization. And, and this is really the tip of the iceberg that I was talking about in terms of opportunities that are there, uh, because this is only specific to urban use cases. Then you have other departments benefits and service delivery, all of which can very, very easily be delivered on top of digit. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes on the impact cases. So this is really what we're looking at uh, in terms of the landscape that's covered. We've got seven plus partner-led programs. Uh, the, uh, the Center for Digital Governance has actually been very aggressively signing up. I think right now the count stands at 14 states have signed MOUs with CDG for implementation of digit-based solutions. And, and more and more states are uh, in talks. And, and the idea is that uh, all of them will start moving into different phases of implementation in the course of the next four to six months. So this is a, this is a very uh, single slide case study on what we were able to do in Punjab, right? And this is truly the power of digit, right? We were able to get a hundred urban local bodies live 
in 90 days. So if you see that the kickoff was on May 2018, and by December 2018, we had 167 urban local bodies live running on top of Digit. Uh, we've, we've also done things like WhatsApp integration where they're able to uh, raise a civic complaint through a WhatsApp chatbot and this gets logged. All of this is transparently available to the citizens and it's seen significant adoption and uh, incremental revenues that are getting generated for these local bodies in Punjab. I'm just going to pause and, and look at the question screens. Um, so I think there are no pending questions at this point of time. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Of uh, how Varun, we have a question from Krishna in Q&A. There is an open session, uh, open question from q &A. Just one minute, please. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Krishna. So... Uh, So uh, Krishna, I, I think, so the first question, which is regarding workflows need offline generation of bills based on some sort of physical checks and would require data sync later. Uh, are there services which will allow for reconciliation? Um, I think I, I would ask Elzan to answer this question. I, the, the ability to uh, access data is absolutely available. Uh, we are now in the process of building offline capability for, for certain apps, which will probably allow for data reconciliation. Uh, but I let Elzan answer this uh, question. Uh, for the second question, which is customers who may want physical systems to hold critical data, are there options implementations where in two instances are created so that there is, so absolutely, the system can be deployed. Uh, so we are completely ag agnostic from a, from a, deployment perspective, you can deploy it on cloud, you can deploy it on-prem, you can deploy it in state data centers. And yes, uh, the way the architecture uh, is, is set up, you can actually have uh, failover systems. Needless to say, uh, the backend data syncs need to be set up. You need to set up jobs so that your primary database is being replicated into the uh, failover or a disaster recovery uh, area. And, and that can absolutely be done. Uh, for the first one, Elzan, would you like to pick it up right now? offline uh, loading of bills or something uh, definitely you can write an utility and use the same apis what is being used at the time of uh, creating um, like online same apis can be used with probably the workflow part being turned off so recommendation is to use the same api so that the data gets synced up into elastic search and various other components down to like so, Bharat, um, if a reported issue is not resolved via the WhatsApp number, what is the next step to do for a citizen? Is there any escalation step? Um, so, in terms of, so, so the next steps is something that you would def define, right, as part of your program setup, right? So, this is basically what we call, uh, so WhatsApp is a channel for, uh, for engaging with public grievance right now how that public grievance is handled is a process based thing which which is completely configurable and customizable so so typically you you would say that if an issue is not handled in 48 hours it needs to be raised to the next level and all of this information can be passed back to to the citizen via whatsapp saying varun you had raised a let's say a, a ticket for garbage cleanup in front of my house because somebody is dumping garbage and the, the SLA for that was 48 hours. In 48 hours, if that garbage was not cleaned or the, the last mile executive did not do his, his or her job, it goes to the next level manager. Uh, they get it in their dashboard and, and the citizen gets a notification saying that it's been escalated. But how that workflow needs to be set up is completely configurable in the system. Hope that answers your question. So coming back to how people are building beyond digit, right? And these are just some of the examples and you would see that it's a combination of governments as well as um, non-government organizations who are picking up digit 
right? So let me just take a couple of them. So for example, there is Samagra Governance, which is a not-for-profit, which is looking at leveraging Digit to create a unified benefits and service delivery platform, right? Uh, Kerala, the state of Kerala has already started building and, and uh, we've signed an MOU with the state of Kerala to build a set of common services which different departments in the Kerala state government can utilize. So, you know, as I was telling you about the problem of each uh, department having multiple payment gateways, multiple SMS gateways. So the Kerala uh, IT department has said that we will expose a set of unified services and these services can be used by the state departments whenever they're building applications so that there is a common uh, platform available and they would be responsible for maintaining and manage, managing it. We have a, for example, we have a very interesting use case with an organization called Agami who are leveraging Digit to actually help with the digitization of the judiciary and, and, and creation of e-courts, right? So they're looking at these building blocks and saying, how can we help the, the high court of a, of a particular state get digitized so that when somebody needs to file a case, they can go onto a portal, do it, make a payment, all that information flows seamlessly through the judicial process. Uh, we have someone like the Piramal Foundation who is looking at creating a legal case management solution on top of Digit for Bihar, uh, MP and, and Chhattisgarh. Uh, they're also looking at looking at using a public grievance system, right, for, for capturing uh, any issues uh, that citizens are having with regards to health or their legal case management. Uh, we are also in talks with, for example, the Jaljeevan Mission in, in Assam, where they are looking at seeing if they can leverage Digit uh, for public grievance grievances and, and addressing it because they, they are looking at, uh, you know, deploying the JJM project across 20,000 villages uh, locations in Assam in the next uh, 12 months. So that's really how we are seeing, uh, you know, the 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 uh, take up of digit happening across India, and one of the things that we are doing and which we are not uh, which we've not covered in slide, but I'll spend a minute to talk about is we are now taking small footsteps and and seeing how we can take some of these learnings from India uh, into the global arena where we are seeing a lot of interest coming out of Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and would be happy to you know pick up specific conversations with uh, organizations and partners which have synergies and are looking at, you know, expanding footprint into those regions or have inquiries uh, in those regions, uh, we'd be happy to engage with you to see how we can support you for those opportunities as well. Um, I, I am done here and I'm going to pause. Uh, we can probably spend a couple of minutes on Q&A uh, and then we can move on to the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arun. Uh... I see a couple of questions, but I guess these have been answered in Q&A box. So coming to Amit, your question of what happens when the escalation period is over and the highest, the ticket will still remain open, right? Uh, I think uh, that's really a, a that's really a process definition that you need to do from from when you define the PGR piece, right? Um, it 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 can be escalated or you mark it as unresolved and closed. I think that's really about how you want to uh, address that particular situation. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we need to move on and yes, uh, we'll Thank get into the and, next uh, session. Hope you guys have an a interesting three-day session. Thank you, Varun. So now we move on to Omkar. Omkar uh, will talk about governance. Thanks, Vibhav. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, please let me know once you see the presentation. Yes, we can. Is this Vibhav? Yep. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Omkar. Uh, I work as a, a senior program manager with eGovernments Foundation. And uh, in, in continuation to Varun's uh, session, I'll be taking you through uh, uh, a brief uh, concept on program governance. So uh, so uh, I, I would like to connect uh, two to three threads from uh, Varun's uh, uh, talk just a couple of minutes ago. 
so one is uh, uh, eager foundation is a impact focused organization right so uh, when we are doing uh, implementations uh, or rollouts of uh, any of our platforms across various uh, uh, geographies uh, uh, rather than just focusing on uh, implementing technology our focus is on achieving impact so that we 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 look at the entire rollout through that lens that is one uh, second is varun spoke about uh, uh, various uh, advisory uh, uh, engagements we do with lot of partners both uh, uh, across market as well as uh, uh, government uh, as well as uh, 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 samaj now so uh, this piece uh, the governance piece plays a plays an important role in uh, uh some of these uh, advisory engagements so this is basically how we think of uh, designing a program right so uh, 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 any any uh, digit rollout is a kind of uh, uh, central to a program and then uh, the way we look at it is that is a program which is designed to drive impact okay so uh, uh, this is this is how we see the uh, governance structure should be so uh, the the governance structure is uh, primarily designed to uh, let's say roll out digit for a specific use case so this is in context of urban but we have uh, very easily uh, uh, kind of extrapolated this to uh, some of our other engagements across public finance as well as sanitation right so the governance structure includes uh, uh, three major components so uh, the the crucial piece of this uh, governance is of course implementation partner uh, the the entity which is actually using digit and implementing uh, a program right so they they form the starting point of the structure uh, above them consists a program management unit or a pmu so this program management unit is uh, tasked with uh, uh, managing the overall rollout uh, uh, of digit as well as uh, kind of uh, uh, troubleshooting uh, or uh, uh, kind of resource allocation and stuff like that so this comprises of uh, senior officials both from the implementation partner side as well as from the government side um and then there is something known as the steering committee so steering committee normally comprises of program sponsors uh, or funders or uh, let's say uh, the people who set the vision and mission for uh, rolling out the program right uh, and then uh, like i was like i mentioned before so any digit rollout is also a chance for uh, um, undertaking digital transformation of that specific function right so in order to support that there are these uh, two committees which we normally propose be put in place uh, to advise uh, the pmu as well as uh, steer group so the first committee uh, is uh, known as the tac or technology advisory committee and the second committee is known as dac which is domain advisory so as their names suggest the technology advisory committee uh, advises uh, steering committee and pmu on long term technology strategy best practices release planning integrations uh, any any uh, strategic decisions uh, specifically around technology which need to be uh, addressed and the domain advisory committee uh, like the name suggests advises uh, steering committee and pmu on various policy reform uh, change management uh, capacity building uh, and so on and so forth uh, these 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 kind of subjects right so uh, uh, again again this is this is a, a, a proposed uh, recommendation which we normally kind of uh, recommend to our uh, stakeholders and um, uh, state uh, engagements uh, but again they might change based on a specific context so in in some cases we have seen that uh, the the state governments have merged both steer co and pmu into one or in some cases there might be just a steering committee which is looking after the entire uh, engagement and then there's they directly onboard an implementation partner so that that flexibility of course uh, is uh, recommended based on uh, the program objective but this is what we normally propose and we have seen this uh, 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 seen this this sort of a structure uh, uh, see decent success in uh, our engagements right uh, moving on so uh, these are these are uh, the the compositions i mean recommended compositions subjects which the uh, uh, committee deals with and the frequency Uh, at which the the committees should convene right so uh, the steering committee like i was uh, mentioning before it comprises of sponsors it comprises of uh, uh, directors of the department or head head of the departments uh, then this uh, comprises of uh, partners or uh, kind of senior uh, representatives from the uh, system uh, 
implementation partner uh, we also uh, uh, participate in uh, steering committees where we are invited and then uh, there are other representatives from maybe other departments uh, so for example if you are doing a transformation mm-hmm. initiative in the urban department so we will normally invite uh, folks from the it department or from the revenue department to be a part of this committee right to kind of uh, get a cross functional view uh, so the steering committee deals with uh, subjects like vision mission of the rollout uh, uh, resource allocation or maybe approving budgets uh, any reforms or policies uh, which need to be kind of uh, addressed uh, while the rollout is happening uh, it the steerco also provides oversight on the rollout and if if any conflicts arise this is the kind of the apex body which uh, works on conflict resolution so uh, our recommendation is that this should normally meet once every month or then as convened by the pm that's the frequency right uh, the next unit is the program management unit so program management unit is typically chaired by head of the department which is kind of undertaking this sort of a transformation exercise uh, this uh, uh, comprises of program managers from both the state as well as the implementation partners uh, this also uh, uh, involves uh, folks who are in charge of procurement so the pmus are the ones uh, we've seen which normally float rfps Uh, and undertake actual procurement so while the steerco approves the budget it is the pmu which actually uh, disburses or utilizes that budget uh, and then uh, this also has representatives from uh, so as i mentioned before this is in the urban context so uh, we have normally seen that uh, senior representatives from ulbs who have kind of been in the field for uh, a significant amount of time and who carry very rich implementation experience so they are also invited to be a part of pm uh the subjects which pmu deals with uh, cover uh, program execution so day to day execution is uh, kind of overseen by the pmu uh then uh, they uh, uh, the pmu also oversees change management so uh, because this is a transformation initiative there is significant amount of change management training capacity building which is required to uh, be done for all, all users not just departmental users but even for citizens so there are various iec campaigns which need to be undertaken there are various awareness campaigns which are required uh, in order for citizens to come and actually use the system voluntarily right so uh, these are some sort of activities uh, which the pmu uh, takes up uh, monitoring and evaluation of the rollout yes uh, that's part of the program execution uh, troubleshooting and escalation Uh, from the field uh, in case it is required and then uh, procurement as i already mentioned so the pmu is convened normally weekly uh, but again uh, this this can be uh, either increased or decreased based on the program priorities uh, the next slide uh, elaborates uh, composition of the two advisory committees uh, which i mentioned before so uh, the technology advisory committee uh, normally Uh, is chaired by either the technology head or it head from the government side uh, this also has some uh, rep- representatives from the pmu mainly program managers uh, uh, e government uh, uh, foundation also has some representatives as part of the tag because we keep on uh, upgrading our platform and this is this is an area where we contribute in advising states on how best to utilize various services of the platform uh, and then this also involves uh, representatives from various uh, tech departments uh, in the government spanning across state data centers nics uh, maybe treasury systems uh, and then we have also seen that there are some rep- representatives from academia who are part of the uh, technology advisory committee so various representatives from iits or iicrs have been part of various uh, pmus uh, uh, across our programs so uh, the subjects which uh, tac normally deals with uh, uh, span across infrastructure which is required to host and operate the platform uh, then various integrations uh, either intra department or external so we've seen that uh, uh, digit has been integrated with a host of external integrations spanning across aadhar uh, then uh, uh, nic's hospital management system or uh, revenue department system or various other systems uh, as as, the, as required by the uh, uh, business use cases and then uh, release planning so uh, uh, again like, like i mentioned so we keep on upgrading digit for uh, patching maybe security flaws or for upgrading uh, or releasing new features and so on and so forth so this is the committee which uh, kind of reviews what upgrades to consume and how should they be rolled out to users what sort of change management on the technology front is required and so on and so forth right and then the domain advisory committee uh, is uh, another crucial committee which deals with uh, 
uh, subjects like policy reforms, uh, any process standardization which is required. Uh, uh, this committee also receives all business requirements or business inputs which come from the field. Uh, it, they triage these business inputs and requirements and feed them back into the implementation roadmap. And then exception handling or uh, exception management, uh, which might come up because there's a lot of standardization and change management which happens as part of these rollouts. So this is the committee which kind of oversees exception uh, handling and management. And then this comprises of uh, domain or subject matter experts from the uh, government side. Uh, this again uh, sees uh, uh, senior representatives from uh, various ULBs or downstream departments. Uh, we've also seen that uh, the government might onboard external consultants, uh, specifically on areas like public finance or procurement or uh, maybe any, any uh, uh, specialized areas uh, which uh, are required. And then uh, this again sees uh, representation, representation from uh, uh, academia. So uh, these are the these are the uh, members who are part of the domain reservoir committee. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Uh, I will I will uh, take any questions uh, if folks have. So Omkar, there is a question in the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. there is a question. So there is a from question. People. Can there be another level at the field such as city project management unit below PMU? Uh, of course, yes. So. Uh, normally large uh, corporations, so so urban local bodies are categorized across three segments. So there are corporations, uh, uh, municipalities and uh, councils or uh, uh, panchayats. So the large corporations normally constitute their uh, own uh, uh, project management units at the ULB level. Okay. Uh... Any other Let's... questions from anyone? We don't see open question. If you have any questions, you can post it in the Q&A box. Else we move to the next. Yeah, back to you, Rupu. Thank you, thank you. Rupu. Thank you, Amkar. Thanks for a crisp and quick session. Uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, before we move next, I have a couple of polls to run among the attendees and uh, uh, so, uh, please do leave your uh, responses. Uh, I'm leaving it for about 30 seconds. Uh, there are three questions that, that we seek your response on this. <clears throat> we'll keep it for 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds more. And once we have a significant responses, Okay, uh, I think uh, we should stop here. Um, and let me just share those results. I hope our speakers and others, uh, speakers and participants can see the results. How, uh, you know, how the audience understand about digit, the resources on training, and this will be available. Thank you everyone for your responses. Uh, over to you, Elton. Hi, Elzan. Uh, we can go ahead with the next session about uh, people practices. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, so hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this is Elson here. Uh, I had the implementation here, like uh, implementation and enablement both. So I will just cover what are the people prerequisite, uh, the technical skill set and uh, what all uh, software and hardware things that they'll be needing to use. Just let me share my screen.
facing some difficulty in sharing. Uh, one second. Vibhur, can you just share your screen? I've just pinged you one link. Sure. Uh, I've got this. Uh, In Slack, I've pinged you one link. This is a, a digital urban web page of tech enablement. Yes. yes. Sure. I'm just doing that. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes, yours is. Yeah, you can just scroll it down. So, uh, yeah. So we have uh, bifurcated into two sets. One, what the skill set the development team needs and what the uh, DevOps team needs. So uh, developer, so we, you know, uh, by now you have understood we're using microservice architecture and we are on Java. So the basic uh, skill set is like uh, they need to be very well versed with uh, open APIs and the usage of Swagger. So all the API contracts are defined in Swagger documents and uh, they should be uh, well versed on how to use, uh, how to read the uh, API signatures and the properties that has been defined in uh, the YAML file. And JSON is the uh, mode of communication between the front end and back end. So that is one more thing. And Postman is the tool which we are using for all API testing or um, for uh, checking uh, uh, different versions of APIs. So basically microservice, uh, the communication between microservices are through API. So if you want to check something, uh, it is through Postman that you generally check. You don't need a front end to uh, validate things. Everything can be validated through Postman APIs. Uh, Postman through uh, APIs and uh, backend we are using Postgres. Uh, it supports any database, but uh, by default, Postgres is what comes as part of Digit. And as I already mentioned, Java and REST APIs, that's a basic. And uh, Elasticsearch, we are using extensively for uh, dashboard and reporting. So uh, all the transaction data gets pushed into Elasticsearch uh, simultaneously as it gets pushed into the database. And it's optional whether you want to use Elasticsearch for reporting or you want to use from the database. But we have certain reports that come from uh, Elasticsearch. The entire dashboard works on Elasticsearch. The source of data for uh, da dashboard is Elasticsearch. So that is important. So Maven, uh, of course, for build, we are using Maven. And Spring Boot is the basic Spring Boot applications that we are using. Kafka is the event queue that we are using. Uh, so all the communic most of the communications are asynchronous and it is taken, uh, we, we are using Kafka for the uh, event queues. Zool is the API gateway what we're using. So that is important. So for the front end, we are using React.js extensively just for uh, POC sake to, uh, to showcase that any, uh, any uh, framework will support. We have used Node.js in one of our uh, module, but uh, most of the modules are on React.js. And WordPress and PHP are used uh, only for the uh, portal part. So we have a web portal that comes as part of the digit stack. Uh, so that is using WordPress and PHP. So this is the uh, technical skill set required for the dev team. Yeah. Can you scroll down? Yeah. So DevOps team. Uh, so basically uh, for um, the kind of platform we are using, we are expecting engineers, to, the development team also to have some basic understanding of DevOps because um, these asynchronous transactions and the Spring Boot application and, and the, the flow of uh, data from services to services, how to debug, all of that basic things they should be aware of. However, we need to have a strong DevOps team with a uh, very good understanding of the below skill sets. So basically, uh, we uh, in, at Eager, we are using AWS or Azure extensively. 
uh, we have seen states uh, using uh, commercial cloud as well as uh, state data center. It is again the discretion of the state uh, to go with whatever they want. So we recommend the DevOps team uh, to have good understanding of uh, commercial cloud at least. State data center basic understanding will be required, but then again, it is not very standard. Every uh, SDC has its own challenges and its own uh, uh, framework and like uh, technology stack and all are different. That's all that that's also we have seen. Yeah. Uh, strong uh, knowledge of Linux commands, VMs, network storage that is required. So Kubernetes cluster, so Kubernetes is what we're using. Uh, so how to install uh, Kubernetes. And then we, we have certain um, uh, scripts, Terraform scripts, uh, things which are already written. And it comes as part of uh, our, our code base for provisioning and all that. So you just need to run certain scripts, but you need to understand how it works internally. So understanding of uh, Terraform and VM provisioning, all of that would be required, though we have uh, utilities to spin up instances and all of that. So uh, we are using load balancer, uh, firewall, all those basic understanding required. For uh, CI, CD, we are using Jenkins. You can use anything you want, but uh, Jenkins is what we prefer. So setting up uh, build pipeline and uh, permissions and all of that, that knowledge is required. Uh, then uh, Groovy, Python, Golang, whatever scripting tools that you're using. So Golang scripts we have for uh, our deployment scripts. Uh, then uh, Docker, experience on making containers and docker is required then all the uh, artifacts and images we are pushing to nexus or docker hub so how to how to uh, maintain the those artifact artifactory and how to grant permission those knowledge will be required zool gateway is uh, something that is very important uh, how to manage the api gateway uh, and how the routing happens and how all of that basic understanding of API gateway is required. Yeah, then um, Kubernetes ingress and SSL certificate and the renewal. This is also very important when it comes to production because uh, there are certificates for the domains that you'll be registering and how do you how do you renew that and how do you set up the license? All of that is important. Uh, GitOps, Git branching, PR review process. These are the basic, uh, I, I would say, day-to-day -day operations that this team will be uh, handling. Uh, with every release, there will be Git branching required and the PR mergers and certain rules that you will have to put in place, like who can merge, who can commit directly and all of that. So those will be handled by the DevOps team and those rules will have to be set in place. Experience in Helm and packaging and deploy. So Helm uh, configurations we are using for deployment. So all the, all the configuration has to be defined in that file and then using that file, uh, deployment happens. So we shouldn't be changing anything directly on the, uh, on, on, on the server. It, it all has to go through Helm configurations. Uh, so JBoss, Apache, Nexus, Redis, Postgres. So these, these things are the uh, tools that we're using. So a few things I've covered above also. So, yeah, so uh, from a people prerequisite point, uh, these are the tools uh, and the technology uh, aspects that uh, the team has to be uh, aware of. And uh, below, so this, this is coming from docs.digital.org only, so you will have access to this page. Below uh, this document, you can find the links for uh, all the hardware prerequisite and the links uh, for all the tools for your uh, further reading. Yeah, I can take up questions now. Uh, I cannot see any question related to this topic. If you have any, I can wait. See, on-premises is possible if you have good uh, uh, servers and all of that, because it is pretty heavy, I would say.
I think we should we just give it a minute for if there are any follow up questions as we move on to the next one. <clears throat> Uh, there is a question from Shweta in the chat box saying Swagger can be used to test API like Postman with a question mark. Looks like a comment, but maybe you understand it better. Yeah, so so Swagger, yeah, you can uh, create a stub out of that and do uh, like how you use a Swagger for any any other uh, uh, things. Yeah. Great. Then, if, if there is no other questions, so thank you, uh, Eljan, for uh, for the session. Uh, I hope this was helpful for uh, for the participants. We move to the next, uh, and uh, I would request uh, Nikesh, Nikesh to go live and uh, you know talk about what are the infrastructural requirements for a digit. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Blizzard. Yeah, am I audible? Yep. Yes, you are. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. So I hope it is visible. Yes, it is. Yeah, thanks, Uber. So when you want to set up a digit or yeah, any other product, first part is come to mind is the infra. You need an infra, certain infra. Either you use a cloud, yeah, any uh, state-specific data center, yeah, NIC data center, or whatever it is. Some prerequisites are there. You need a uh, cloud. If you are going with HDC, you need a VM, master node, uh, uh, worker node, as well as you need a strong network and load balancer, H proxy machine and bash machine to spin up the Ansible. Everything that is the requirement here. And if you are going with the cloud, AWS, Azure, anything, GCP, yeah, other clouds also like uh, Oracle. Uh, you need a you need to have the understanding of the nodes, how we can node, you need a Terraform templates. You have to create your own Terraform accordingly. And again, that part, uh, you need worker nodes, master nodes accordingly. This is the prerequisite for the infra. As per your, what you choose, cloud, AI, state, a specific data center accordingly you have to choose this one first is the ubuntu machine when you going to spin up your uh, worker node and master node uh, it's good it need to have the some operating system that is you can choose ubuntu we recommended ubuntu it's uh, about 16 plus because already you know 16 is uh, they disintegrated the 16 version it's now 18 20 it's running so debian we can use centos uh, real this is nothing but the rhl uh, Red Hat operating system, you can use that one. Whatever you feel good, you can use that. And another thing is what the operating system, each machine in master, it should have, at least it should have the, the 4 GB of RAM and 2 GB of CPU. You can use more, uh, more, uh, more, but this is the less configuration. And again, move to the, the worker nodes. Worker nodes also should have the, the Ubuntu and whatever you choose in the master node that should have in the worker node also, that same OS. You should not have the different different OSs and different different nodes. Like master, it has the Ubuntu. Go with the Ubuntu in the node, in the worker nodes also. Same here also, we need a 2 GB RAM for this one and 2 GB CPU. It's accordingly how many you, you will be. Like uh, we already discussed, we have multiple digits, has a multiple product, multiple ULBs, everything. How much your traffic, how much your uh, product you are going to host accordingly, you can choose your infra. This part we will cover in DevOps session. What is the infra sizing? I'm just giving you the, the prerequisites here. Then is uh, Mac, you need some uh, Mac configuration. Like if you are going to, SDC environment, you have to go from the scratch. You have you need NIC, you need a public gateway, you need load balancer, HA proxy, uh, this Mac configuration, you need to uh, configure network load balancing. That's in cloud, all the things are getting taken by the cloud things. So there you don't have to worry about that this much things. But SDC, yeah, you sure have to analyze first things. Your network is strong or not, you can. Uh, your network is has a load balancer house. it's like a, you have two nic or not if it is a one network went down automatically another node uh, another network should come up and it should handle the traffic whatever it's traffic and this uh, this is the protocol you have to open when you are setting the master node you have to open this port range and another for worker node you have to open this port range 
and this is the complete infra specific like uh, when you are setting the infra we follow the some strategy like you need a vpn under the vpn uh, vpn is nothing but the uh, virtual uh, private cloud private network under that we will create one private network and we will create one public network in that private network we will host everything that is the security reason also to we host all the things under under the private network so outside people it's not able to hack you yeah, are not able to it is security reasons only most of the reason most of the times and in public network public you know, public subnet we will host the internet gateway load balancer so it can your whatever you host in the private network it should talk to your public via load balancer so at least huh, of course we need a kubernetes Kubernetes to orchestrate over all the uh, pods or all the containers, manage the secrets, more, manage the stateful state deployments, uh, config maps, everything. And we need another worker uh, Kubernetes on the worker node. There is a uh, two set of the things. One is the master and one is the worker node. And Kubernetes manage all of this. And it is the counts are different. Each uh, environment has a count different. Dev has a three VM master count, and UAT has a three, and production has a three. Similarly, in the for the worker nodes, it is the count is different. It's still it varies according to how much ULB you are going to host. According to this is the some rough values we have provided. If you go with the minimum ULB, uh, this will help you. And production has the five. And NFS, NFS value, NFS storage, we use to store the file storage. Like when you are going live, everybody, everybody is going to put their complaint. They are going to attach some particular screenshot, yeah, complaint screenshot, yeah, any street light is not working. Considering in sanitizer, street light is not working. They are going to take a picture and they are going to upload that. To store that, we need a NFS or iSCSI storage. And in cloud, we use the S3 bucket. But if you are going with the STC, we need a yeah, at least NFS or ISCSI value. That size should be one TB. And that is also varies again. Uh, in Dev, it is 100 GB, UAT 800 GB and one TB. This is the IOPS uh, network thought pool. How do your network should be strong? This is the all storage where to values you have to care. Uh, SDC team basically care about this one. When you set up in this one, you should see this values should match. Like you need a, a, a thought put values should match to 1000 Mbps per second, internet speed. Like you should have the two broadband connect, uh, lease connections, not broadband, lease connection. So one went down, automatically we, uh, one will come and it will start handling traffic and each should have the, the at least one Mbps per second speed. NAT configuration. When we talk about the private and public network, whatever it is in a private network, it should get communicate with, uh, communicate to the our public network. That, uh, that for that we use the NAT configuration, NAT and per internet gateway configuration. And LV basically, when your request is coming uh, coming to the the cluster, it come through the load balancer. Load balancer handles everything. So you, we need a strong load balancer so can handle much and more. And at the peak time, it will start handling the more and more traffic without uh, lagging, without uh, causing any issues. Availability reason. This is the cloud things. So, so what availability reasons means? Uh, cloud provide the multiple reasons. To host that means one reason uh, due to some reason if anything happened to one region it automatically other two region can handle other things like uh, we have three, five nodes and one uh, there is a two region in south one a south one b and south one c we are hosting a two nodes on south one a and two nodes uh, two two nodes on the south one a and uh, one b and one c if ha anything happened to one a automatically all the traffic get route to the one a one b and one c so it, there won't be issue in your productions. VLAN configuration, that is a similar one. Uh, private VLAN, we ought to talk about the VLAN, how we need a separate uh, private network. Consider a gateway. Uh, we use a Zool, and this is the NAT internet gateway and SMS payment gateway and SMS gateway that you need basically when you are doing the payment transaction, you need a certain gateway. Uh, with your bank authority, uh, with bank approvals, and SMS gateway. 
to send out the messages when somebody raise a complaint they should get a verification sms for that we need a sms gateway firewall uh, if you are in sdc you need a firewall to handle your traffic to manage the uh, manage whatever traffic is coming to your nodes ci yeah, coming to your load balancer it's go through the firewall first of all. if it is a cloud we use our uh, zool uh, and another we use in a uh, in, uh, in uh, nginx ingress and web firewall database we mostly go with the postgres but in ifix we are using the mongodb mariadb that also and that is the uh, whatever size that is also depend on what environment it is it is the dev uat prod we uh, we recommend a different different size it's like a, a one vm if you are going with the sdc environment one vm with the the four v core and 14 uh, 16 gb ram that will be enough and 16 gb a hard disk to store that data that will be enough if you are going with the uh, aws that uh, m4 uh, m4 large will be enough mm, and prod if you are going with the prod we recommended the, the master and master and read replica so whatever your traffic is going to the master it will on peak time it will handle master and whatever your other task it will should handle by the replica read replica and cicd another we have different cluster for cicd we don't host the jenkins in the same cluster as the uat dev and production environment we use the separate uh, cluster itself and that for separate cluster we need one master and one worker node combination and again for worker node for master we need a, a four uh, for vcpu and 8 gb ram and similar for worker node also Uh, nexus repo see when you create uh, some uh, when you build a package we need something to host that nexus repo is the done that part we will host some packaging some dependencies in that rep in that uh, nexus repository and whenever you you trigger the you start compiling your code using the cicd it will pull that and it will build your app uh, build your where yeah whatever whatever it is your artifact extension document docker registry basically we in ego digit we use the docker images we'll bind everything under the docker image like where whatever your dependency will bind it will build a docker image and we'll push it to docker hub registry so you we need a docker hub registry each state should have their own docker hub registry it should not like a ego has one so we cannot push everything to ego state specific when you set up a ci cd state going to have their own docker hub registry their own github account their everything your dns records domain registry everything should have their own so they can start managing by themselves everything github account like uh, we for code base we use the github account a github account is the source code that we use to pull our code uh, devops devops repository yeah code whatever your devops related file helm chart that we discussed helm chart to host that we use the, the github dns record next part is dns domain to host the, your your application like a digit you are going to get a, any platform to host that you need a subdomain for that you need a, a subdomain that configured it like if it is a, with government it's a go.in yeah it is a other things if you, it is not with government you are going to digit.org with that with that yeah, another your domain you have to purchase that subdomain first from the godaddy yeah it's a, from your state ssl certificate uh, there is a ssl certificate we can use the managed certificate it's managed by by state specific people like you can purchase a certain ssl certificate and we can find that to our url and otherwise you we use the let's encrypt that is the free version of ssl certificate that provide us a 90 day certificate it get renewed automatically you don't have to worry about that to renew that things it will automatically get renewed but most of the state won't go with a free one so you can purchase your own certificate and we can bind that to our cluster yeah any questions on this guys
Hello, Uber. Uh, no, we do not have any questions as of now. You can unmute. Whoever have the questions, just raise a hand. I can take directly question. You can unmute them. So this part, infra requisitory, prerequisitory, we try to cover in more in a DevOps session. DevOps session, I will cover this in depth. What exactly needed and uh, to spin up your cluster, spin up your or infra part uh, deployment, everything. This is the uh, basic stuff, and you can access whatever our prerequisitory is in urbandigit.org. Infra prerequisitories here. All these are documented, well documented. Okay, that's it, Vibur. If anybody, nobody have Thank any questions. You, yeah, if you do not have any further question, I think this is the end of the session and we will reconvene at 2.30 uh, for our sessions where, uh, where our colleagues will take you through the architecture, microservices and coexistence. Uh, of the platform uh, that will be a um, further detailed uh, overview about the digital uh, digit platform. And uh, yeah, so let's connect it to 30 uh, once again. Before you go, please do leave your feedback as we you know end the session, uh, they, you will be redirected for a feedback uh, form. It will take only not more than 30 seconds for you to give your feedback, but will help us in future sessions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Varun, Nikesh, Omkar, and Zan for the session today. Thanks, Varun. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you, Vibor.